on this Ash Wednesday, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Last week, my husband and I went to a lecture on preaching at Augsburg College in Minneapolis. And the speaker was the Minnesota author by the name of William Kent Kruger, an author who's written books like Ordinary Grace and his mystery crime fiction, Cork O'Connor series. Some of you may have read, as I've read a number of his books. And he was presenting on Storied by God. And in his presentation, he made the comment, he's an author, and he made the comment, every good story needs a great beginning to draw in the readers, to, to grab the readers in. Well, as I was working on tonight's Ash Wednesday service, I thought about William Kent Kruger's comment. Because just like a, a good story needs a great beginning, so also we could say our worship service always needs a great beginning so as to, to, to draw us in. And tonight's service could hardly have a better grab us with a, getting our attention than what we started with tonight that we just had. With those words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I mean, if, if anything gets our attention, those words do. Remember that we are all dust, and one day we shall all return to dust. It's a stark reminder, isn't it, of our mortality, and it's how we begin every Ash Wednesday service. And no one escapes. Those words were said over every person, young or old or middle-aged, who came forward tonight. This stark, even uncomfortable reminder says to all of us, yes, one day this life on this earth will be over. We dare not put our trust in the temporary fleeting things of this world, but in the eternal treasures of God. A stark reminder is sobering, and yet it's a gift because it causes us to ask, so how shall we live then? One day we're all going to die and our earthly days are over one day. Well, what is life about? How are we to live now? Tonight's God story, as I just read it from Mark 9, helps us with those questions. Mark 9, Jesus is, is predicting his upcoming passion again, and here Jesus is talking to us about what really counts for life. What is life that is really life? He's talking about how we measure greatness. Oh, not that we are to measure greatness by the world's standards, but by God's values and by God's standards, that where we are to find life is in serving. We ask those questions. What makes for greatness? How do we get status? Because that's what this God story tonight is about. And in Mark 9, that was a live and as real question for those disciples as it is for us today. And Jesus has just told his disciples of what's going to happen to him. He says, referring to himself, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed over to human hands and will be killed and on the third day rise again. And they don't get it. They just can't get it. And they were afraid to ask. And not only that, but on the heels of Jesus talking about suffering and dying, what are the disciples doing? They're arguing about who's the greatest, 
Who has the most status? Who's number one? And they're jockeying and they're posturing for their status and position in the kingdom. And it's as, 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 as though Jesus says, whoa, time out. This isn't what I'm about. This isn't what the kingdom's about. Here's what the kingdom is all about. And we hear in Mark 9, 35, go home and underline it in your Bibles if you don't have it underlined. It's a great verse. Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Whoever wants to be great must be a servant. This is greatness turned on end. This is the topsy-turvy values of God's kingdom. The way to be great is to serve. The way to have true life, life that's genuine, authentic life, is to stoop low and to be a servant. But that's not how we always think, is it? I mean, how does the world measure greatness and status? For some, it's measured by popularity. Who's in? Who's out? Who's popular? Who's not? Who do I want to be seen with so that I look cool? Or for some, it's measured by clothes we wear, labels that tell others if we've made it or not. I mean, advertising bombards us constantly, telling us what we must buy or have or consume or do or be in order to tell the world our status our greatness, our worth. And oh, if you are like I, it is so easy to measure a person's status or worth or greatness with the wrong things. And we pray, Lord, forgive our foolishness. Forgive our foolishness. Jesus says the way to be great is to serve. To know life that is truly life means stooping low and serving. As followers of Christ, our greatness is measured by welcoming and serving the littlest and the least and the seemingly unimportant and seemingly insignificant among us, around us. But what does that look like? Last fall, our congregational book read for the fall was a book by Adam Hamilton, pastor in the Methodist Church in the Kansas City area. And the book video series is entitled, When Christians Get It Wrong. And Adam Hamilton in this is, is featured on the video of this book video study. And he uses such great stories, engaging stories. And in the last session, he had one where he contrasted in such a powerful way getting it wrong and getting it right when it comes to serving. Both of them were about coaches, about athletic teams in Christian schools in Texas. And his first example went like this. It was a, a, a very, very large Christian school in the Dallas, Texas area. And they had a good girls' high school basketball team. And this girls' high school basketball team from this very large Christian school was now going to play the girls' high school basketball team from a very, very small Christian school. In fact, so small there was only 20 girls in the whole high school, and eight of them were on the girls' high school basketball team. <laughs> but as the game began, it was clear that this small school was in no way going to be a competition for this bigger size school. At halftime, it was 59 to 0. 59 to 0. So what does a coach do? Do you keep pressing? Do you, put, you keep your, your first string players in? Do you just go for the kill? Well, that's what this coach did. The end of the game, it was 100 to 0. You know, people were cheering. Amazing victory. But really, Adam Hamilton said, I mean, they just crushed 
these girls from this small school? And he, he raised the question, I think that coach just lost the purpose of it all. But then he contrasts it with another coach, another story. But let's listen to Ad, Adam Hamilton, about two and a half minute clip. Adam Hamilton telling us the contrasting story. Let's listen. All right. Well, the other contrast, though, was uh, when a Christian squad got it right. And again, it was thanks to a coach, uh, Coach Hogan at uh, Grapevine Faith High School. This is another Christian school in, uh, in the Texas area. And they were playing football. Their boys football team was playing the um, Gainesville State High School boys football team. And as the Gainesville State High School boys team was coming to play, this was the last game of the season, and Grapevine Faith was 6-2 uh, and two in their record. They were already uh, going to win their division. And they were playing a team that was 0-8. 0-8, and, and, and they'd been shut out six of their eight games. They had uh, scored six points in two games. The rest of the games they had lost 41-0, 45-0, 49-0, 52-0. And this team was coming to play at Grapevine Faith. Now, the other thing you want to know is that the team from Gainesville had no parents traveling with them, no family members, no friends, no cheerleading squad. They were from the Gainesville maximum security uh, facility for high school students. Uh, they traveled on a bus with security guards. So the coach at Grapevine Faith said, uh, sent a letter to all the parents in the high school and said, we'd like to ask half of you to sit on the Gainesville side of the stadium for the football game. And we want you to cheer the Gainesville guys on. We want you to cheer them uh, to, to play their best and to play their hardest and, and cheer against your own kids. We're going to take half of our cheerleaders and we're gonna put them on their side of the stadium and we're gonna ask them to cheer on those boys. We're asking for volunteers to form a spirit line and we'll have a banner out there and these kids for the first time in their high school football career are gonna break through a banner when they come out onto, onto the field. And when these kids ran onto the field, the stadium just erupted in applause for these kids, broke out in applause for them. The kids were dumbfounded. Why are these people cheering for us? They thought there was some mistake. They played this game, and, and at halftime, it was clear that Grapevine was going to win the game. Grapevine put in their not second string, but their third string players in the second half of the game. And for the first time all season, Gainesville scored two touchdowns in one game. They still lost the game, but they scored two touchdowns. And that was such an exciting thing that when the game was over, they gave their coach a Gatorade bath. <laughs> and the coach of the Gainesville team from the, from the prison grabbed Coach Hogan after the game, grabbed him by the shoulder and said, you will never, ever know how much this meant to these boys. You'll just never know. Tears flowing down their faces. And, and the boys are crowded on the bus, and, and, the, and the fans and the, and the team from Grapevine Faith is waving goodbye to them on the bus, and all the kids crammed on the one side of the bus just looking at these parents who are wishing them well as they leave. One coach got it wrong. One coach got it right. I love that story. And I love the line. Coach, you'll never, ever guess and imagine what this did for these boys tonight. A life-changing opportunity. And every day we have opportunities. The workplace, school, at the football field, in the music room, at home, where greatness is found by serving, where real life is found by stooping low and encouraging another looking around and seeing the needs and, and helping another make it across the finish line. With this service, we now enter into this holy season of, of Lent. Forty days. A time to grow deeper in our walk with Jesus, as our banner says, to live Christ. Not just to know some things about Christ, but to live Christ to practice the faith. And our theme for this year's Lenten journey is this, power life, live Christ. So you see, there's power in Jesus, but it's not the power to dominate or to coerce, but it is power to serve, to give ourselves away to serve. And each Wednesday, we'll take one of the core faith practices and can see how we take it out of the word power. It's so cool. Prayer, worship, welcoming, serving, reading scripture. The faith core practices 
each Wednesday one of those to grow deeper in our walk with Jesus. Come and join us on this journey. Come and know the power of the cross. Because what we receive tonight was not simply a smear of dusty ash, but it was made powerfully in the shape of the cross. A powerful reminder of our Lord who went to the cross, who gave everything for us, died and was raised, defeating all the powers of death and evil and sin, so that, yes, when we breathe our last on this earth and we come to the end in Christ, it will be a new beginning in life eternal. Now that's a beginning like no other. And until that day, people of God, until that day, how shall we live? What is life about? Real life, true greatness is found in serving. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.